Uh, so for those of y'all who don't know me, my name is Scott Godinez. I am the youth pastor here. Uh, our senior pastor, Anthony, is out of town right now, so I'm pretty sure that means that I'm in charge of everything now, so <laughs> kind of a cool deal. No, but really, he asked me to preach, and I, and I was super grateful for it. I love, absolutely love preaching. And, and speaking of being in love, or speaking of love, I'm going to see a show of hands really quick. How many people would say that they've been in love before? Yeah, yeah, there you go. All, all the wives are like elbowing their husbands, like, you better raise your hand. <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's great. That's great. I, I also have been in love with my, my beautiful wife. She's, she's over there, um, Mary Ann. We've actually celebrated seven years of marriage this summer. We had our seventh anniversary, which I'm really excited about because I imagine from here it just gets easier from here on out, right? <laughs> I know you mean yes. Well, we actually met in college at a, a coffee shop of all places. I don't even like coffee. Uh, and it's kind of funny how, how God does that. I love all of our, our different love stories, how God just uses these really cool things and, and funny things that happen. And, and even though they may be different, I think we can all agree that when we're in the throes of love, when we're madly in love, we can be known to, uh, to do or, or say some kind of some silly things. So with my wife's permission, I actually have with me this morning two 100% real nearly 10-year-old uh, love letters that we wrote back in 2010 to each other. Um, we were about two months into dating, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a few excerpts from them, and uh, I give you permission to enjoy these. <laughs> All right, so May 27, 2010. So I'm in college. Um, Marion was working at a, uh, a summer camp, and um, I was working for the college pastor. I was like the receptionist, and uh, so I wrote... Bunch of letters. Here's the first one. <laughs> I miss you, Marianne. I miss you a lot. It's starting to really suck without, with you gone. Every song I hear, every sight I see, they all remind me of you. I miss hearing you laugh and seeing you smile. I'm not sad, but I do miss you. And keeps going. We just talked on the phone. It rocked. Oh, yeah. You always know how to make me feel better with the things you say. In fact, I feel inspired by having just talked with you momentarily. I certainly will never stop thanking God for you. You're like Christmas. Smiley face. <laughs> Signed, Scott Godinez, I miss you. Put a little H there, you know, because it's cute. Did you miss him? Oh, I did. <laughs> this next one will prove it. I have a way with words, and so I wrote several short poems for her, as any gentleman does. Here's the first one. Marianne, Marianne, pretty brown hair, cute as a button, or a teddy bear. Here's the next one. Like a bird landing with no grace, but you make funny sounds and have a pretty face. <laughs> I'm telling you, Dr. Seuss better watch out. <laughs> Last one. And this one, if, if all my youth, if all my teenage guys, y'all better be taking notes. This one's, this one's gold here. Marianne, Marianne. Tough as a hardcore biker. Hot as a fireball. That's why I like her. <laughs> oh, it gets better. I got a little excerpt at the end, because you can't just end on that. I wish my poem was as beautiful as you, but that's not possible. Oops, I spilled some cheese whiz all over my previous sentence. Ha, 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 ha. Get it? Because it's cheesy. If you don't believe in miracles, God is still working in souls like this. No, but I've actually owned my game. Last year I started writing haikus. I got a whole little book of them for Marianne. So no, it's great. But I wanted to share this with you today to emphasize how powerful, how influential our desires can be in our lives. You know, that summer, Mary and I, we wrote letters to each other practically every day. In fact, there was one day that um, I actually ran four miles to the post office in pouring rain because uh, I was completely broke, and I had no money, and I couldn't afford to put gas in my car. 
But somehow that was less of a concern to me than making sure I got my letter mailed off to Marianne on time. And obviously it's not revolutionary to say that our desires tend to dictate our actions. This effect is seen in every relationship we have, and and most especially in our relationship with God. See, when our deepest desires reflect the heart of God, we find ourselves seeking the will of God. So right now, I want to share with you the entire point of this morning's message, like like right here. It's obedience to God reaps the promises of God. Like it's so simple, right? Like I love the simplicity. We desire God. We obey God. We receive more of God through his promises. Throughout the Bible, we find simple truths like this one all over the place. And it's no surprise that it prompted men like Augustine to claim that the Bible is shallow enough for a child not to drown but deep enough for an elephant to swim. So in the spirit of Augustine's quote, I'm going to ask you to join me in the deep end. We're going to dive in a bit deeper to answer this bigger question. How? If we need only obey God to receive his promises, why are so many Christians wallowing in their own sin? Why are so many people right here in Colorado turning away from God? Why are more and more Americans walking away from the church and identifying as unaffiliated with any religion? How does a person ensure the longevity of their walk with Jesus and the fulfillment of God's promises? And so we're going to be looking at Deuteronomy 4, 9, but I want to just talk about Deuteronomy for a second. This book is easily one of the most influential books in the Old Testament. In fact, it's quoted more than 80 times in the New Testament, making it one of the most popular books to reference by New Testament authors. Jesus himself even referenced or used the verses from Deuteronomy against Satan when he was resisting the temptation in the wilderness. And so where we are in this book is that the Hebrews, they've been wandering in the desert for 40 years as a result of this constant disobedience to God. And now they stood with the Jordan River before them, the promised land, a new generation invited to claim the promised land of God. It was an exciting occasion. So we're going to catch up with Moses in the middle of one of his speeches to the Hebrews. He would use lessons from their past to try to prepare them for the future. Perhaps with this generation, they would remember the one true God, having learned from the mistakes of their parents. So our first point here is that desire determines obedience. We're going to break up this verse into three parts. Moses begins with, only take care and keep your soul diligently. Now, first we need to really incorporate the context of this verse to accurately understand what Moses is talking about. We we need to define the word soul. Because we use the word soul to mean all sorts of things. We say things like, he's got soul. Or she really put her heart and soul into starting that business. We have the code SOS for save our souls. We have other things like soul food or say, or we might say he's gone soul searching. So which definition are we to use in this context? Moses is using the word soul to mean our desires and choices. So much of this chapter, we're going to see Moses consistently urging the Hebrews to listen to the statutes and the rules and to do them. The things that God's called them to do. In just a few chapters, the widely recognized verse in Deuteronomy 6, 5, also known as the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. See, Moses is commanding that our desires and actions be for God and God alone. The psalmist writes something similar to this in in Psalm 42, 1. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. This is actually a fairly common use for the word soul. In Hebrew psychology, there, there wasn't really a distinction between desire and personality. The whole of one's personality would be demonstrated by their desires. And so here we find Moses exhorting the Hebrews to take care of what they desire. In fact, he uses the same word shamar twice. It's first translated as care, and then again as keep. Moses is reinforcing the necessity to watch over one's soul, to watch over one's desires. See, our desires are an extension of our priorities. Moses knew that this next generation coming into the promised land would inevitably face challenges that revealed their priorities. And if they allowed anything to become more important than their relationship with God, surely disaster would follow. The command from Moses is to guard our desires. But the challenge is how? 
For the follower of Christ, how can we determine whether our desires are of God or self? In Galatians, Paul speaks to this point. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, excuse me, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's compare these actions with the next verse when Paul details the works of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Largely the difference here is the desires of the flesh are always going to require less sacrifice for a perceived benefit to self. But the desires of the Spirit will almost always require greater sacrifice of self to the actual benefit of others. Again, in Romans, Paul writes, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Let's, let's use these verses as kind of a, a litmus test. Consider any given desire or choice you might make and ask yourself, which side of the spectrum might this decision most accurately reside? Is it going to be closer to the side that is self-seeking, self-serving, or the side that seeks to outdo one another in showing honor? And what if, what if we are on that side where we're self-seeking and, and we, we, we want to be over here, we want to be over here saying, God, help change my desires. How do we move from one side of the spectrum to the right side? And, and Paul comes in again. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And I put ESV there because in, the, in a moment I'm going to show you the same verse but a different translation. And this next translation is actually from uh, the message. And it's, it's more of like a commentary. It's going to kind of unpack. And I really like how it's going to communicate uh, the essence of, of, this, of this verse. So we'll look at it again in the message. So here's what I want you to do. With God helping you, take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. By fixing our attention on God, we concern ourselves with what God is concerned about. We keep our desires in sync with God, and we can avoid the consequence of forgetting the things of God. See, because without a desire for God, we will depart from God. This next part, Moses continues, Lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. It's really important to notice the, the progression of Moses' logic right here. Did you see the order of what Moses just said? He makes it clear that through the keeping of our souls, we will remember all that God has done. We cannot simply have an awareness of what God has done and expect that memory to keep our souls. Moses is making it clear that actions are required from us to prevent us from forgetting God. This is cause for serious concern. To forget God would invite apathy toward truth and ultimately allow us to substitute our worship for God with worship toward something else. And this is exactly what Moses warned the Hebrews against, as we see in the later verses of chapter 4. Beware, lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure. The likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. And beware, lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. There's a lot to take in there, but what I want to draw your attention to is simply that when the people of God, 
are not actively pursuing God with their choices and desires, then they will always drift from God. If you are not growing closer to God, you are drifting away from him. There is no in between. But what's especially interesting to me in this speech is that Moses is giving examples. He's giving examples of what sort of idolatry they're most likely to suffer. Carved images in the likeness of man or woman, animals, even the sun, moon, and stars. Moses reminds us that we are people of God's great inheritance. And to submit ourselves before anything less than God would rob us of our inheritance. But in 2019, it's probably safe to say that most of us here are not worshiping golden cow statues in our kitchen. We're not praying to the moon or anything like that. Surely we're educated enough to recognize the futility of basing our lives around something so trivial and foolish. So I asked myself, what would Moses warn us about in 2019 at Cornerstone Church? What would Moses want us to be concerned about in Colorado? See, I'm confident that Moses' warning didn't appear as silly when he said it as it, does, as it does today when we read it. So what subtle idolatry might seep into our lives that perhaps has gone unnoticed or worse, accepted? Let me tell you a story about a church in Walden, Colorado. I was invited to preach there a few years ago. And if you've ever been to Walden, you know that it's not a very big town. Uh, Walden boasts a population just shy of about 600 people. And uh, in some seasons, the moose can outnumber the residents. So I've been asked to come in as a, as a guest speaker. And while I was there, I got to speak with the pastor about the church. And he shared with me three stories. The first story was a brief history of the church. How it once was this beacon in the small community. And now, after years of infighting and strife, the church had dwindled to about eight people, none younger than 65. The church was literally dying off one at a time. The last decision the church made when it was in operational health was a desperate move to surrender all the rights of their church, everything they owned, all their law, I don't know how churches work, but all their stuff to the Colorado Baptist Convention, hoping that the convention would be able to leverage its resources and funding to help the church, help keep the church running. And through that process, it also allowed the convention to bring in a new pastor. He shared with me that if the church still had any say in his employment, they likely would have fired him months after he arrived. Because there was so much resistance to his passion to reach the community. The second story was really encouraging, though. The pastor wanted to reach more of the children in the community. So he partnered with another church who sent a team of volunteers to help him run a VBS, a vacation Bible school, for the kids in Walden. In fact, it was so successful that during their week of VBS, the church got nearly every one of the 65 kids in Walden to pass through their front doors. He described it like, like the kind of spiritual revival you read in the book of Acts. I expected him to say, you know, all these kids came and they heard about Jesus and they got saved and their families came and then they got transformed, they got saved and the whole community was just transformed. But in less than two weeks, not a single kid remained at that church. One other thing you should know that will help explain. When the pastor toured me around the small church, he took me to the basement and showed me one of the most well-organized food bank ministries I've ever seen in my life. Like, it straight up looked like a Trader Joe's or like a, like a Whole Foods down there. Every shelf was perfectly manicured. It was an organizational paradise. And they had a ton of food, too. Like, it took up almost half the space in the basement. The pastor told me how passionate the members of the church were to develop this ministry. It was one of the things the church was known for in the community. By now, some of you already know how the story is going to unfold. During the week of VBS, the basement was filled with children, and it wasn't quite as orderly as it was normally. After VBS, the pastor wanted to start a Sunday school for the kids in the basement, but he was told it was impossible. The kids take up too much space. And not only did he face resistance from the church members, there was one church member in particular who made it their mission to make every child feel unwelcome. And so on Sunday, I preached my heart out to a packed house of 12 people, four of whom included myself, my wife, the pastor, and his wife. See, it's great that they served food to people, but even Jesus makes it clear. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Ironically, a, a reference from Deuteronomy chapter 8. 
The church prided themselves on their ability to give away food, but was unwilling to make adjustments to give away the word of God. When preferences become priorities, comfort becomes our idol. We, when we allow our ideas, our sacred things, to take precedent over the calling of Jesus to make disciples, we are no better than the fool worshiping a piece of bark or a golden calf. Church, please hear my broken heart. I cannot imagine another church succumbing to the fallacy that our wants are somehow greater than the calling of God, that our comfort, our compulsion for control is somehow appropriate conduct in our relationship with God. We are worshiping idols. At another church, I had the opportunity to interview their pastor for a video I was making, and he shared with me some of the most refreshing words I've heard from a ministry leader. I had asked him about their, their bright red carpet that was 60 years old and covered their whole sanctuary. He laughed and told me how much he loved it. He then went on to, sh- uh, to share about how they purposely haven't bought new carpet or replaced the old wooden pews because the church wants to funnel their resources toward ministries directly reaching the lost. He said to me, Scott, the uncomfortable pews remind us that this church isn't about us. Or even for us, it's for God to do with whatever he calls us to. Now, I recognize there's there's a balance to this. And even that pastor would agree to spending money on their facility. But what amazes me is the culture of their congregation that is willfully forsaking the opportunity to improve their literal comfort because they'd rather see resources going toward gospel-sharing, disciple-making ministry. Since that conversation five years ago, That church has planted more than 15 new churches across Colorado, Wyoming, Missouri, and California. There is too much at stake for a church to remain stagnant. We rob ourselves of the promises of God, our infinite inheritance, when we build a church around our personal desires and comfort zones. If we elevate our preferences, our comfort, and seek to establish a boundary dividing the saints from the ain'ts, Jesus makes it clear that he is the true authority in the church, and his words ring heavily. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. May this never be said of us or any church. But if Moses knew his people, if Moses knew his people who had witnessed the seas parting in half, pillars of fire at night, water from rock, food from heaven, and a voice from a mountaintop, if he knew that they were vulnerable to falling away, how much so are we? We live in an era where we have Christian celebrities publicly walking away from their faith. We have Christian leaders left and right embroiled in scandal and disgracefully dragging the name of Christ through the mud. Do not for a second think anyone is immune. Jesus was face to face with his disciples, and yet still he felt the need to say during their final supper, do this in remembrance of me. Why would he say that if not for the possibility that they might forget? The inheritance of God's promise awaits us. And we cannot allow ourselves to ever forget God. So Moses gives us an alternative. He commands not to forget God and to instead make these things known to our children and our children's children. And so we desire for others to desire God. Lastly, Moses gives us this. Make them known to your children and your children's children. I mean, could there be a better verse for emphasizing the the value of, of children's ministry? Like parents, grandparents, God has invited you to an incredible ministry opportunity. Uncles, aunts, cousins, brothers, sisters, tell tell everybody. Tell everyone how great Jesus is and the things he's shown you. The promise of God for the church is that the gates of hell will never overcome it. We shall never lose out to evil. Jesus has made his bride victorious over the enemy. We ought to take this life in Christ and live empowered, confident that through the holy church of Jesus, we can see victory in our marriages. We can see victory in our schools, victory in our courtrooms, jobs. Shoot, I wouldn't mind a little victory in the morning carpool lane. Dear Christian, 
We're not called to be passive surfboard Christians, waiting for that perfect wave, that stars aligning moment when everything works out and is super easy for that chance to share the gospel with someone. Jesus has made it so that we are more than conquerors. What do we have to fear? What persecution can come that our Lord has not already faced and overcome? What rejection hasn't Jesus already experienced? What crashing wave hasn't he already walked upon? What darkness hasn't our Lord Jesus already illuminated? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Consider this quote from the missionary Jim Elliott, who died trying to share the gospel with an unreached people group in South America. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. In your obedience to God, you have the infinite inheritance of God's blessing and promise before you. How badly do you hunger for it? I pray it's a devastating starvation, driving your every desire, shaping your every choice to see the promises of God fulfilled, not just in your life, but in the lives of every person in your life. Church, who isn't here today that you wish were here? Who doesn't know Jesus the way you know Jesus? Who is that person? We're called to have a heart burdened for them. No preference no iota of comfort, no anything will stand in our way to reach out to them with the good news of Jesus. It truly is good news. And you know what? I have even more good news. Moses knew that no amount of warning or preparation would be perfect in preventing this generation from failure. So I want to point out one more thing from his speech. I'm certain that there's a few of us this morning, who might think we've missed our shot. Maybe we've made some choices. We're certain there's no coming back. Like Moses, our mistakes have earned us a place beyond the promise of God, left on the outside looking in. Dear friend, you couldn't be more wrong. Or maybe you're here this morning, and the thought of God's promises sound like empty words, a false hope even. And while I admit I do not know what has led you to feel that way, I want to assure you, that's also incorrect. God's promises are more reliable than a sunrise. And he has already made a way for you. And for every one of us who feels trapped in our past, bound to a reputation we can't seem to escape. So Moses encouraged this generation. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. But from there... You will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him. If you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul, when you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord God, your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. Y'all, this is the gospel. This is the love of Jesus right here in the Old Testament. We who had once been enemies of God were saved by the grace of God when Jesus came to earth and loved us in spite of our sin. And in his merciful compassion, he took our punishment and died in our place, rose three days later that we may have life anew in him. And through our repentance, we accept this free gift of grace and are reunited with God, inheriting the promise of our Father for all eternity. If there's a breath in your lungs this morning, it's because God put it there that you might praise him and his faithful love. You are never too far gone, and there is nothing God won't do to restore his relationship with you. How could we ever say no to our God and his limitless love? Let us turn to God, holding nothing back, always remembering that in our obedience and desire for him, we reap his incredible promises. So today I challenge all of us, God has given you the message of the gospel. His love letter to every person on the planet. Are you willing to run through the wind and the rain to see it delivered? 
Let's pray. God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for being a God of first, second, third, a bajillion chances. Lord, your infinite mercy is so beautiful. Thank you for calling us out that we can follow you, that, that it's so simple. We simply desire you and obey you, and we can, you can experience all that you have for us. God, you are truly a good, good father, and we praise you for this. We rejoice in this, and Lord, we, we take this opportunity to repent of anything that maybe we've allowed to take seat on the altar of our heart where only you belong. God, and encourage those of us who feel like, feel like maybe we've, We've distanced ourselves from you or, or we're stuck on the outside looking in. Encourage us that, that because of what Jesus did, because he tore that veil, we have access to you, God, for now and for eternity. God, thank you. Pour into our hearts a spirit of courage that we may go out. We may think of that name of that person who we wish were here, that person you love, that person Jesus bled for. God, use us as a church, a city, a light on a hill shining bright for all to see. Use us to bring glory to your name, Jesus. Thank you so much, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.